Right, welcome back class. So um, this module is going to also go into Android mobile malware static analysis um, with the key difference that this time we'll be looking at actual um, piece of malware that was put together um, at one point in time. <clears throat> so um, here, I'll just close this. So the uh, sample that we'll be looking at was actually um, uh, posted some years back uh, as an educational sample um, in this older walkthrough here that I have linked. Um, so it's right here. Uh, this link still works right now. It's to Mediafire. Um, since I uh, don't want to bet that it's going to work forever, uh, I actually grabbed a copy of it um, and it's hosted here. So if you want to pull it down, it's inside of a zip file. And the encryption password on the zip files right here. So I already have it uh, downloaded into my Kali VM so that uh, all of you can see it. Um, and we'll start off this one uh, the same way that we started off the other one, which is we'll use APK tool to pull some of the files out. So I'm going to do APK tool again like that. So APK tool D, and then I'm going to give it the output folder. So dash O, we'll say sysec app dot APK tool, and then I need to give it the APK file. So I'll let this one work for a little bit, and there it's unpacked. And you can see that it's uh, created this folder here. And we have a layout that's uh, pretty much identical uh, to the one that we saw in the last uh, in the last video, right? So you have the Android manifest is right here in the APK tool.yml. So let's look at this APK tool.yml first and try and see what uh, it pulled out. So the first thing that sticks out at me is that this one is a whole lot a whole lot smaller uh, than the uh, APK. Uh, apk tool.yaml that was in the previous example. Uh, additionally, it lists the minimum SDK version is 8 and the target SDK version is 17. Uh, so this application was compiled using a much older version of uh, the Android SDK tools as well, uh, which isn't surprising. This one, um, I believe, was posted um, for that reverse engineering class in 2013. Um, so that's a good seven years ago now. Um, so quite some time ago, many phones ago. So the other thing we can look at is the Android manifest.xml, which has been extracted for us. And the first thing you'll notice here is that there is a whole bunch of permissions that this thing uh, says it uses. Um, it says it uses the call logs, write call log. Um, you know, uh, wake lock, uh, read history bookmarks, read calendar, read contacts, access the internet, read user dictionary, receive SMS, read SMS. So this thing wants to do, wants access to pretty much everything on your phone. So that itself, um, and this is a really great example how um, maybe you can build analysis that um, on its own right may just look at um, an obscene level of uh, permission requests um, as evidence of um, suspicious uh, behavior. So within here too, uh, we're able to see um, that the package is this de.rub.sysec. And then down here, it lists uh, the activity is this de.rubsysec.amazed.amazed activity. So there's an amazed activity class that's somewhere in there uh, that we'll want to look at. The other things that are in here is a reference um, for a receiver to this SMS receiver. Um, and then also a reference to on boot receiver. 
so a lot of um, one of the key th things to keep in mind with uh, Android apps um, is that they don't have a uh, standard like you know you double click it or you run it on the command line and then it starts running at one spot and then it continues running and continues running and interacts with the user until um, the user performs some operation that exits the program. So this isn't like Microsoft Word or your web browser or something like that. Um, uh, most of the apps uh, that get loaded onto your mobile device um, are intended to interact with the different inputs that your mobile device has. Um, in addition to that, uh, they're also oftentimes expected to inter interface with the different services that are on the mobile device, some of which might be provided um, by other applications as well. So instead of having this kind of single entry point uh, like an EXE file has, um, and then kind of a linear progression through the program, which finally gets to a completion state, um, also known as like choosing exit from the file menu or something like that, um, these programs will actually have um, hooks where, such as in this case, you want this, you want some code within this application to run every time an SMS is received. Um, that's what this is for right here. Um, you know, we might, uh, in the previous application, we might have something that's wanting to be notified when um, the position, you know, when the location services are updated, those types of things. So most of the applications on your phone are designed to um, all be loaded simultaneously, especially the most frequently used applications, um, and then basically stay resident, um, but pause uh, the primary execution loop while they're not uh, foregrounded on your phone, while they're not the front app, right? The one that you're looking at on the um, on the flat screen. So the structure of the application is a lot more complicated. Um, in addition to that, the um, underlying architecture is really built around Java. Uh, well, Dalvik and uh, DEX is the primary uh, execution engine, so Java-like execution engine, which means that <clears throat> it has to adopt all of the conventions within Java, which is um, that every single um, every single object you're passing around is a um, is a class object for the most part. Um, you know, and you're calling methods on different class objects, and even the uh, the main entry point for the program is not a numeric address somewhere in the file like it was on the exe files. Um, the entry point to the program is actually a named function um, where you give it the string name of the function, uh, and then it executes that, and that's a um, you know that's a standard string, right? Um, uh, type, which is a little bit more complex than just a, you know, integer address. Um, in this case, um, it's multiple different um, entry points. So you have um, the on alarm receiver, which might be one of the entry points, um, and then you have this service uh, runner, which might be another one, and position service, which might be another one. Um, each one of those things that you're registering with um, the service tags or the receiver tags or the activity tags, um, Java expects a, a class that implements a certain interface um, to be what a maze activity or position service or run, runner are, um, or on alarm receiver. And for each one of those, it's a different class definition. Um, so they're, you know, in a nutshell, there ends up being a different function underneath each one of those classes that's supposed to be the entry point for that specific type of um, a, you know behavior that's being registered. <clears throat> so we gathered some information about this, um, and I have this in the notes, right? So um, the big thing being that I have a list, a short list of classes right here. Um, so I have the what I consider to be the main class uh, of the amazed activity, and then. I have these five other classes that are all defined within the package that the author put together for this, right? So not the standard Android library package, but the uh, 
um, the actual package that this de.rub.sysec put together. So there's actually two sub packages here, well, three sub packages. It's amazed, receiver, and NEU. Um, not sure what all the significance is of each one of them, um, but we can look at uh, at least some of them uh, when we open this up in Ghidra. So um, rather than trying to jump in and pull all these things apart with JAD, I thought that it would be a real good thing to go and uh, look at these with Ghidra. Um, so to do that, because I don't actually have the um, the classes.dex in here, uh, the first thing I have to do is I'm going to make a new folder for this. So so I'm going to unzip the APK file itself. I unzipped the whole thing. If I wanted to just get the classes.dex, and this is what I have documented on the uh, lecture notes, if I just wanted to get the classes.dex um, or all the dex files, I could do that. Um, but I just went ahead and extracted everything. So now what I'll do is I'll load up Ghidra. So um, if you're using Kali, this isn't going to be in the standard Kali um, off the website, but um, the one that's distributed with the class has Ghidra installed, uh, right? Um, you can also run Ghidra from the command line. It's very simple to install. So I'm going to load it up. <clears throat> and once I load it up, I'm going to create a new project, right? So a new project. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put the project inside of the subfolder that I'm working in here. And I'll give it a nice descriptive name like, um, you know, sysec app project, like that, right? So that's loaded. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I hit the I button. So I'll do this for the menu for you all. So the import file, if you just hit I, it'll import it. So what I, what I have here is I actually have some uh, example stuff from the uh, a few dry runs of this, right? Um, but here's the directory that I loaded this into. So um, I'm going to go into the unpacked folder that I just made. I'm going to pull the classes.dex out of that. So now it's going to present me with a uh, container file detected. So <clears throat> um, this is one thing that I ran into. For some reason, it identifies the classes.dex as a um, container file format, um, just like it recognized the jar file as a container file format as well. Um, so that's not exactly what I, you know, that's not exactly what I want um, it to do. <clears throat> I'd prefer to have it treated like a, a single file. And as you can see here, this gives single file as the uh, default option on here. Uh, which is helpful. So I'm going to go ahead uh, with that. Um, and I'll show you in a second uh, why I want to do it as a single file instead of a um, instead of an archive of uh, multiple different files. And so now it's imported it in the project. I'm going to double click on it um, to analyze it. And this will open it up in the, you know, the disassembly view. And then I'd like it to analyze it. So one of the nice things here is that um, there are a bunch of Android specific options that show up now in the analyzer. Uh, so there's a bunch of uh, analysis customization that's already built into Ghidra um, that's targeted on Android malware analysis as well. So I'm going to go ahead and analyze that. And this is doing the normal thing that it does. Uh, let me shrink this down a little bit so I can fit the window on the screen. You know, so it's running through the different analysis phases. Um, it finally finished. I'm going to go ahead and save the analysis because um, it's an autosave. Um, and we'll remember that um, over here, excuse me, over here, we felt that this amazed activity was uh, particularly interesting. 
So one of the things I can do here is I can actually walk through um, the classes down here. And this is one of the big benefits to, um, to using Ghidra for analyzing the DEX file. Um, you actually don't get this um, beneficial feature when you're analyzing jar files because it breaks the um, classes, the Java classes up into separate files, right? Um, so you actually aren't able to see all the different classes collapsed under one uh, folder here. So this is really helpful for me because um, I, you know, like any application, um, the classes aren't isolated on the island by, the, by themselves. Um, the classes actually interact, you know, interact with one another and expect to, uh, to cooperate. So the amazed activity is the class um, that we were looking at before, right? And that's right here. So this ends up being the basic copy constructor for the amazed activity. What we may want to look at is the onCreate function um, as the event that's fired when this is created. This one happens to have a little bit more uh, details in it. So um, looking through here, we can see that um, it calls the superclasses on create uh, method. Um, and then uh, in these lines here, it seems to, it asks for a system service called alarm. Uh, and then it uses check cast so it verifies um, that that uh, response it gets from this is actually the um, is actually an alarm manager type uh, reference so the alarm manager class uh, needs to be the class type of it um, and that's more of like a runtime validation thing um, just to make sure that um, all the assumptions uh, can, that are made afterward uh, can be validated so then um, it creates a new, what's called a new intent. Um, so it's like a item of work um, that um, Android OS uses uh, to try to describe those um, discrete little, almost what I'd call programlets or little functions um, that uh, need to run during various events. So earlier I described um, that there were some actions such as uh, receiving an SMS or uh, getting network access or starting up the phone, um, you know, uh, all of those things. Um, <clears throat> the applications can set set up so that they have code um, or classes that execute uh, when those events happen uh, globally on the phone. So even if I don't have this application open. When I receive an SMS message, this application uh, wants to be notified of that and wants to get the information inside of that SMS message. Um, so what this is doing is this sets up an intent, um, sets up a, um, a broadcast listener, um, or actually sets up a, um, a, a broadcast um, a sender, a broadcast notification object. Uh, so something that'll, um, you know, that can be used to call a function um, when an event occurs, basically. Um, and then what it does is it sets up a repeating notification that uses this LVAR1 um, plus 10,000. So LVAR1 is initialized with the system clock, the current time. Um, and then we add 10,000 to that. So basically... Uh, 10 seconds, because this is in milliseconds. Um, so 10 seconds from the time this line of code runs, um, we want to run the intent that's wrapped inside of this PVAR2. So the one that we created up here on, on alarm receiver. So there's a lot of complexity here um, that's based on the whole like event-driven programming paradigm. But uh, the key thing to keep in mind is that this right here is scheduling 10 seconds from now 
a job to run that executes code that's in this class. And then after it runs, it's going to rerun it every 15 seconds. So it's scheduling this kind of background job almost to run. Uh, the other thing that's got going on is it creates a new amazed view, um, which um, that's going to typically be um, the view is typically going to be the uh, uh, the thing uh, that the screen is showing you uh, when you run the app. So if you want to produce uh, you know information to the user, uh, which this app definitely wants to do, even though it's bad, um, it wants the user to think that it's an app that does something constructive. And it has to provide the user with a UI in order to do that. So I'm going to go and check out the on alarm receiver class. Um, and, um, and just another side note here, you'll notice that the classes, the class hierarchy has also been flattened. Um, so none of the classes have the three, four, or five level um, directories underneath them. Uh, it's describing this to you in terms of the actual class names. So let's go to this on alarm receiver class, right? And let's look at the different functions that it has in here. So there's this one, which is just the bare constructor. And then there's an on receive class. <clears throat> so uh, when it receives, so again, this thing is an alarm receiver. So when it receives that alarm that was set up in the previous class, so that alarm that's supposed to start going off 10 minutes from now and then, or 10 seconds from now, excuse me. And then after that, it's supposed to go off on 15 second intervals. Um, so basically keep a heartbeat going. <clears throat> All of that is going to cause this on receive um, to fire. And so on receive is the generic method uh, that if you are writing a class that's supposed to receive events, uh, then upon receiving an event, um, this function that you're supposed to implement gets called. So the down here, um, there's a, a new intent is created that's called a runner. Um, and then that service is started. Uh, and then also a new intent is created that's called position service. And then that service is also started. So if you recall, when we're looking up here, there were two services that were registered right here, um, both of which have names that correspond to those. So this code is setting up that application, um, you know, the application's services that it's, you know, that it's got, um, and then it's starting them up. So it's going to run them in the background. And so, but it, it's matching the stuff that was here in the Android XML. So the next one I'm going to look at um, is runner because it is the first one in this list. Um, if you're analyzing this out, you know, in the wild, um, typically what you're going to end up doing is keeping track of a lot of these things as you encounter them. And this is kind of what I started doing here. Um, I'm not going to go through a whole exhaustive analysis of every single one of these. Uh, during this uh, lecture, um, but I will go through some of them. So this one ends up being the first one, so I'd like to go and take a look at it. Um, or I, I say the first one, but I mean the next one. Um, so I can scroll down, I find it down here. <clears throat> and then I can see that it has a number of functions that are uh, defined. Um, so when using the symbol tree, and this is something I didn't cover earlier, there's a number of different symbols here that show up. Um, the way this is set up is that um, if the function, and I can click on this dump SMS, if the function is implemented within this class, um, then it shows up as a little purple F or magenta F. If the function uh, is not implemented within this class, if the function is a um, external function, and we can see that right here, um, then it gets a green circle. Uh, and so a lot of times, you know, if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, there's a concept of subclassing, right? So 
Um, you'll have parent class oftentimes is a little bit more abstract and then the child classes get to be more specific. Um, so every class um, that's set up in here, including runner, um, is a subclass of a class that is um, that has a relatively complex definition uh, inside of the Android a uh, API, right? Um, so in this case, um, runner, um, I go through here and, you know, maybe I'd look at the, um, you know, constructors, um, you know, and the work. Um, so the work function, and this might not be a bad place to start, um, the work function um, provides uh, kind of the sequence of, you know, the straightforward sequence of work that this will perform. So you can see here it performs an is online check and then it walks through here, gets GPS coordinates, gets network coordinates, um, or it can run through this stuff and then I can get to this steal function down here. So one of the things that I marked down, so I've gone through a lot of this stuff here, and then we were looking at the onCreate function earlier, which brought us to this function. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, one of the things that we'll look at here is analyzing the uh, analyzing the different calls. So um, there's a lot of functions here that appear to do a number of different things, um, but there's a lot of them. And I don't want to walk through all of them at once right now. I kind of want to get an idea of the flow um, without having to do that by hand. So one way I could try to do that um, could be uh, trying to look at the uh, function call graph. So in the window menu, menu here, there's a choice called function call graph, which is right here. And the function call graph um, <clears throat> will allow you to diagram the call relationships between the different functions within the program. So I have it right here. And as you can see, um, here's the work function that we're on. Um, this actually has the um, do wakeful work um, is the event method that's actually called um, in order to kick this off. And um, what will happen is I'll hover over some of these. Um, so like this, right? And you can see these little icons show up here. So if I hover over work, I can actually use this to expand and collapse the branches. So the bottom one is for the um, is for the um, the outgoing edges, and then the top ones for the incoming edges. <clears throat> but then what I can also do is I can move these around, so that it's kind of easier for me to work with this if I want to. Um, So there we go. So this one ends up having a whole bunch of function calls coming out of it, right? And so what I can do is I can actually organize these things kind of nicely. It'll help add some sanity to my analysis like this. Um, so it ends up being really helpful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this for, well, I'll, I'll leave it open, but I'll jump over here um, to where I have um, these things actually diagrammed here. Uh, so I laid this out um, earlier on um, by you know, kind of dragging them around. Um, one of the things that I learned here is that, um, that you know, I thought the entry point might be work, but it turns out that the entry point to this code is actually the do wakeful work function. Um, that's what calls work. 
and then work ends up calling out to these four different functions. So we remember looking at the isOnline function. Um, and then we also saw the get GPS coordinates, get network coordinates, and then the steal function. Uh, so it looks like the body of the rest of the calls end up being uh, from this steal function. And you can see it calls things like um, recalendar, get lat, get long. So these are probably related to GPS coordinates, um, get timestamp, uh, read browser bookmarks, read browser searches. So find out what the user has been doing within their web browser. Um, is read dictionary, uh, read contacts, read call log, um, dump SMS. So it has a bunch of functions in here for extracting um, pretty much each one of those um, permissions that it was asking for in the Android manifest XML up here, right? So these things that we carved out, these things that we carved out earlier, um, looks like the steal function is trying to call every single one of those. So I have it kind of carved out right here, <clears throat> what it's doing. So, um, you know, if I'm trying to, you know, again, malware analysis is all about learning about the learning things about the malware, um, because um, the organization that you're trying to inform, whether it's uh, customers that you have um, who are paying for your services, or whether it's a a bank that you happen to work at, or something like that, they'll encounter malware, encounter something you know, weird that ended up on the CEO's phone or something like that. They want you to give them answers about it. So right here, um, I've diagrammed this out and I'm able to immediately add to my report, like, hey, there's, you know, these, you know, nine different um, things are, you know, collected by this, um, you know, by this program. Um, in addition to that, there's some reference to prepare send. Um, but even if there wasn't, you know, I, I might walk through, um, I might walk through some of the functions, right? So send data, for instance, I might walk in there and just look and say, okay, so it opens up a socket, you know, that type of stuff. So, you know, <clears throat> might look for any of the code that's trying to open up a socket. Um, you know, that type of thing is a way to find out um, uh, what's trying to communicate over the network or not. So, you know, anyhow, that, you know, that's a pretty straightforward way um, to look at it. Um, the problem you'll ultimately run into a lot of times is that the functions don't always have these very descriptive names about what they do, right? So a lot of authors might obfuscate their code in a handful of ways, like we saw in the um, in the Java analysis in the la last lecture, um, or two lectures ago, right, the last week. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, doing that, that's going to require you to step through each one of these nodes um, and you can use some of the patterns that you see here. So for instance, uh, the big difference between these three and this one is that this one makes about three or four times more calls than all three of these functions combined. So this one looks like the bulk of the work is done in it. Uh, likewise, if I was to trace this out and find out which function is actually doing the um, you know, the delivery of data, um, that'd be this one right here, you know, the prepare send. So, um, you know, and then finally, um, because uh, Android uh, works by kind of maintaining these um, global assets on your phone, so your calendar, uh, your contacts, your uh, phone log, your SMS messages, your browser history, like all of these things end up being um, something that's uh, ingrained object in the operating system and not always considered to be this kind of um, general purpose application or something. Um, even if you don't have the function names in here, um, performing some searching to look for things like, um, you know, we'll go into the read calendar, for instance, right? <clears throat> 
to look for things like that it's asking for the calendars um, and it's doing this type of stuff right here, right? Um, there's a lot of hints here that the adversary really can't get around. You have to re refer to the calendar um, in the Android phone um, through one of these very descriptive strings in order to actually get access to it. Um, there's all sorts of ways where they can try to obfuscate it, um, and that just re means that your, you know, your work is a little bit more cut out for you than other times. Um, but ultimately, they have to get them out in this way, and they have to, you know, they have to bundle them up um, in a certain way, and all of that stuff. So, um, you know, that's the the calendar one is right there. Um, the one that was interesting, I go over it in the lecture notes, but I can walk through it here, was the read dictionary function, right? So the read dictionary function, like, well, I wonder what dictionary they're talking about. So I go down here, um, and I pull in, uh, or I notice that they're trying to access this thing called user dictionary. So maybe I'll copy that and I'll put it up here and I'll say like, you know, user dictionary Android, right? And this is where the Android developer docs are really helpful. So again, just like um, having the x86 assembly documentation and then the Win32 API available um, just a click away when you're doing Windows malware analysis, I find it's always helpful to have this stuff available when you're doing, you know, Linux malware analysis. Um, because, or not Linux malware analysis, excuse me, um, Android malware analysis. Um, because uh, all of these classes have to be used uh, in order for someone's uh, program uh, to interact with the, um, with the phone objects. So in this case, this is a provider of user-defined words for input methods used for predictive text input. So um, when you're typing on your keyboard uh, on your phone, on your mobile device um, and you get those word hints um, that come up um, and some of you might have even noticed that, um, you know, after you buy your phone, um, the word hints end up more accurately matching uh, what you're talking about um, and even start to use things that you say or names of people that you talk about or talk to and stuff like that. That's all um, that's all buried in here um, in the user dictionary and it's basically a big kind of frequency table of the words um, that are entered by you uh, when you're writing anything, when you're responding to text messages, when you're searching for things, etc. Um, and it's a nice gold mine um, oftentimes for um, an adversary to steal information, especially information that the user of the phone um, thought they deleted, right? Um, you can go through there and you can learn things like project names and stuff like that that maybe uh, they want to keep more sensitive. So <clears throat> what I learned is that this code here, get dictionary function, is trying to pull content, trying to pull the word frequencies, and I can get, uh, you know, that that guesstimation is reinforced by the fact that it's creating a table here that has word and frequency um, as the uh, as the columns. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I um, I can go and um, hypothetically, if this was just called function one or something like that, and I walked through this, um, reading this stuff, seeing that it's pulling this out, um, that is going to do the user dictionary class and that it uh, is pulling out the word frequencies here. Um, all of those things contribute to um, to give me the uh, understanding or the confidence that this whole thing is trying to get, um, trying to collect a copy of the user, um, user in a words database. So what I might wanna do is make this more evident to someone uh, who's analyzing this, or at least more evident to myself in the future. Uh, so I can rename the function if I want to, to maybe read, um, and I'll call it predictive dictionary, right? Um, 
And this works, um, you know, this renaming. Um, I know I didn't use it a whole lot earlier, but uh, when you're analyzing Windows code, um, this can also be extremely helpful as well um, because you'll be working through functions that, you know, if the symbols have all been stripped, you'll be working through functions um, that really don't have any descriptive names. Um, and we encountered that when we were looking at the uh, revolution backdoor, revolution shell um, samples as well. Um, so you can see it's changed here. Um, the other thing that's nice is it's changed up here automatically. Um, it also changed over here automatically, so I don't have to refresh anything. Um, and then also, um, if I was to show the function call graph, it's changed here again. So let me navigate to the steal function. So now I'm in the steal function. And then if I was to go down here, I should be able to find that it has similarly uh, changed down here as well. And you can see right here is a line where that's uh, also modified. So one of the nice things is that um, when we started out this, we were able to get a list of functions that were present in the file uh, that did something interesting. And we grabbed those from that graph of nodes that were coming out of the steal function. Um, if I was working through this uh, uh, as if it were an obfuscated piece of uh, mobile malware, um, I'd probably have to walk through each one of those functions one at a time on the list. Um, rather than having to keep a bunch of notes here uh, next to me where I have to write down a mapping between a function name or a function address and uh, what I think it does, um, this gives me a nice easy way of being able to make that change while I'm analyzing the function immediately when I get the answer. Um, and then Ghidra saves it uh, throughout the program wherever that's called. Now one uh, caveat to this um, I'll just throw out there is uh, if you remember there was a do wakeful work uh, function was the entry point to this. <clears throat> so the um, super class is this wakeful intent service. So runner wakeful intent service. Um, if I was to go and change this do wakeful work function, then the on, uh, give me one second. Yeah, then the do wakeful work right here, um, it would likely lose the connection between this one, uh, which is undefined here, and the version up here. So we would lose the information that this is, and I can actually try it right here um, really quick. So if I do the rename function, I'm gonna do, you know, do wakeful work, you know, extra, right? I'm gonna do that. Um, so then if I go down here, you can see that this one has no reference to it at all. Um, and then also, if I go back up here for do wakeful work, um, because of the way that this all, you know, operates, um, this isn't connected to that uh, base function anymore. Uh, so, you know, the key takeaway here is that um, the labeling of the functions can be really helpful, um, but you do want to make sure that you realize that um, if you are relabeling a function, um, which is a um, override, which is a function override from a parent class. Um, the parent class's implementation of that function is not going to be relabeled. Um, so you're going to, that is a case where you're going to have to, you know, write notes down and then make sure that you manually go through and do, you know, like this, right? So I'm going to have to, I would have to go here and change it to do wakeful work extra right here as well. Um, so that I could chase that change that I made. Um, because that way, if I have someone coming along to try and analyze this in the future, um, uh, this way uh, they can see the, um, they can 
much more easily see the code, um, you know, the linkages between the classes uh, that I want them to see uh, when they're doing analysis. So um, that said, um, thank you very much.